Welcome to Cornerstone Church, and thank you for joining us for today's service. Here are some ways for you and your family to stay connected. Child dedication will take place at all services on Mother's Day weekend, May 8th and 9th. This is an opportunity for parents to commit to raising their children according to God's Word. Stop by the Next Steps area to register or sign up online by Sunday, May 2nd. Join us on May 15th and 16th for Cornerstone Meetups. This is an opportunity to get together with your campus family for refreshments and fellowship. Listen up after the announcements for more details from your campus pastor. The National Day of Prayer is coming up on Thursday, May 6th. Join us in prayer for our nation from 12 to 2 p.m. at 2nd Street Campus or 6 to 8 p.m. at March Street Campus. Our usual Wednesday evening prayer meeting on Facebook will be canceled this week as we observe the National Day of Prayer the following day. Our first impressions teams are looking for a few new smiling faces to join them. If you enjoy meeting and greeting new people, stop by the Next Steps area for more information and to sign up to be involved. Don't forget to download the Church Center app or visit our website to fill out the connection card to stay up to date on what's happening here at Cornerstone. If you are new or visiting, we're so happy you're here. Stop by our Welcome Center to say hi and to get plugged in. And let's continue to pray for our ministry partners and missionaries. Check out these ways you can pray for Mark and Debbie McLaughlin with serving in mission during the coming week. Thanks for joining us and have a great week. Before we move any further, as I said, we're going to take some time and we are going to lift up the McLaughlins in prayer as they minister in Ethiopia. So would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for the work that the McLaughlins are doing and the privilege that they have to do it in your name and for your glory. Lord, we pray that you would be with them, that you would guide them, that your spirit would fill them, that you would prepare the hearts of the men and women and children who they share life with and share your gospel with, and for their fellow ministry workers, Lord. We know that the world hates you, Lord Jesus, and therefore will hate us as we proclaim how good and glorious you are, and that you are the only way to be made right with our Father in heaven. The only way to have eternity with our Heavenly Father is through you, Lord Jesus. And so we pray that the McLaughlins would fearlessly and boldly proclaim your truth, your love, your gospel of grace and mercy and forgiveness, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we are going to continue our sermon series in Acts today. And you may have noticed some of the extra things that we have done for the children today, and that is because the first weekend of the month, we always do a family service. And trying to get the kids a little bit more involved and inviting them to stay in here during the service, well, we're going to have a little one come up, and she is going to read our text for us today. So Summer, why don't you come on up here, and we are going to read from Acts chapter 10, the very last couple of verses of the chapter. You got this, Summer? While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from the among circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then P Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Amen. Well done, Summer. Well done. I'm going to put this microphone over here for now. 
All right, so if you have been with us at all the last couple of weeks, then you have been hearing us preach through the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, or as perhaps more accurately um, described, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the Lord moving through His people, the church, as they came to faith, as they proclaimed boldly the gospel, as the enemy came against them, and as the Spirit, through all of those things, constantly moved them and prepared them and comforted them and convicted them and strengthened them and did everything that the Spirit does. And so now, Peter, who was one of the apostles of Christ, who Jesus took on pretty much every special secret mission that he did, right? He took Peter with him everywhere, has gone in obedience to a vision that the Spirit of God showed him to a centurion's home, a Gentile named Cornelius, where he has just, and we heard this last week, he has just preached a tremendous message about the person and work of Jesus Christ. He declared the glory of our God. He declared the power of our risen Savior. And our text picks up here, and we are going to see today two baptisms that occur. Two baptisms that occur, and we're going to go through this quickly but we're going to look at the text. I'm going to point out a couple of nuggets as we go along, and then we're going to look at some points of application before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Kids, I'm looking at you kids. I have an important job for you. I need you guys to listen to the story really carefully because I'm going to call you up here in a little bit, and you're going to act out the story, okay? All right, and then all of your parents are going to try to guess what part of the story you're acting out. It's going to be great. All right, little group charades. It's going to be fun. All right, so we got two baptisms here. But before we get to the baptisms, we're just going to go through the text verse by verse, okay? So if you have your Bibles open, take them out. And I'm not going to read the text verse by verse. Summer did an excellent job just doing that. Instead, I'm just going to do a little bit of pointing out, a little little uh, exegesis, a little um, e evaluation of the text here as we exhort this. So the first thing we see is that while Peter was still speaking about Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God moves. Now, the text doesn't tell us explicitly that Cornelius and his family put their faith in Jesus. It doesn't say that. It's kind of implied based off of what Peter is preaching to them at the time, right? And so I want us to make sure that we note that this wasn't just the Spirit of God moving and responding in a vacuum. This was the Spirit of God moving in response to the faith of Cornelius and his family as they heard the Word of God, as they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ being proclaimed, being preached. Romans chapter 10, a very famous passage, I'm going to read it just to remind us of what our job is. Remember, the, the sermon series is called To the Ends of the Earth, right? Right? And what we are hoping, what we are praying, what we are expecting the Lord to do in our midst is to make us a people who grow in our knowledge of God, right, and of how he works, how he uses his church, and to seek to walk in the power and the filling of the Spirit that we may boldly proclaim the gospel as our brothers and sisters way back then did, right? That is our hope in this series, why we are taking our time to go through it. And in order to do that, we need to speak up, don't we? Right? That can't just be something that we say we're living out and never talking about, right? Because Romans 10 says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Peter, verse, verses just before this, is proclaiming the word of Christ, p- preaching the gospel of salvation through submission to Jesus, repentance and trusting in him. And in that moment, while he is still speaking, the text says that the Spirit fell on Cornelius and his family. The Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, verse 45 says. All who heard the word. All who heard the word and who believed. Now, I would encourage you, because we don't have the time, go back to the beginning of this series when Pastor Tim preached through Acts chapter 2, through Pentecost, the first time the Spirit of God was poured out in the New Covenant era, right? And he breaks down the theology of this brilliantly and makes it very easy to understand. I am not going to rehash all of that, okay? I'm just going to make a couple of points. First and foremost, notice that the Spirit of God is poured out. These believers are baptized in the Spirit the instant they believe, the moment they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And and so we see that the baptism of the Spirit occurs in conjunction with, simultaneously with, concurrently with our faith being placed in Christ. And that is very important because there are a bunch of different perspectives and theologies that view baptism of the Spirit separate as a unique act, separate and apart from the initial filling. And I just want to point out that Scripture shows us here and elsewhere that the baptism of the Spirit is synonymous with our salvation, with putting our faith in Christ. Now, we are called to be filled with the Spirit in an ongoing way, and you can look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which commands us, it says, do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a command to us on a continuing, ongoing basis every day to seek to have the Spirit of God fill us. But the filling of the Spirit is different than the initial baptism of the Spirit when we believe, all right? That's all I'm going to say on that because Pastor Tim preached an entire sermon on it. Please go back and listen to it on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But when this happens, when we have this first baptism that occurs, confirming that these Gentiles are receiving the exact same treatment that the Samaritans received, that the Jews received at Pentecost, verse 45 tells us that the Jews there, the the circumcised who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. This is a fun Greek word. If you like the Greek, it is a little bit more explicit sometimes than our English. It literally means to be out of your mind. It's like they went wild. They went crazy. They were completely out of sorts and astonished by what God was doing. It's, it, this Greek word is, we like to say, it blew my mind, right? That's exactly what this Greek is expressing. They never in a million years would have expected that the God of this universe would invite Gentiles into his kingdom, into his family. 
And again, I'm not going to go too deeply into that because earlier, uh, just a couple weeks back, Pastor Kyle and then Pastor Tim after him preached about this amazing, crazy thing that the Lord does by inviting Gentiles to be adopted into his family as sons, just as the Jewish people and the Samaritan people before them had been earlier in Acts, okay? Crazy. They are blown away by this truth. And I want to remind us that the Lord does things in Acts for a very particular and specific purpose. It's very important when we're reading the Bible to understand when a text is descriptive versus prescriptive, right? Meaning, whether it's describing something that we should know and that we should be aware of and that we should interact with, or whether it is prescribing a specific expectation of thought, of behavior, of speech, right? The majority of the book of Acts, church, is descriptive. It is describing how the Lord moved through His Spirit, moving through His church to share the gospel to the ends of the earth, ultimately all through the world, right? Praise God. You and I here today are a product of their faithfulness, amen? And so we praise God because of what they have done, but we also recognize that we are called to take that baton and continue it, right? But the Lord is doing these special, unique things, and the pouring out of the Spirit in this way is one of them. It doesn't mean that He doesn't do this anymore. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, amen? right? He, it's His prerogative. He does what He wants, when He wants, how He wants. Lord, You are God and we are not. Take it away, right? It's His show. But that being said, in four very specific instances, He pours the Spirit out this way, and each one for a uh, intentional reason, right? We see it in Pentecost, which we've already mentioned, Acts chapter 2. We see it in Acts chapter 8 when the Samaritans and with the Samaritans, right, with Philip and Peter and John, right, when that's going on, when the Spirit comes and then Simon Magus is like, hey, I want to have that. Remember that, right? We talked through that in Acts chapter 8. Now here in Acts chapter 10 with the Gentiles, we see the pattern here, Jews, half Jews, Gentiles, right? Each one a different class of people who the Lord was bringing into the mix, bringing into the mix, bringing into the mix. The last one that we will study, Lord willing, is going to be in Acts chapter 19 when Paul goes to Ephesus and he encounters believers who have only been explained the baptism of John, i.e. John the Baptist, of repentance, right? And they don't even know about the Holy Spirit. And so then Paul explains it to them, he prays over them, boom, the Holy Spirit falls. And so those folks, while they were Jews, they are an image and an example of the Old Testament saints, right? Those who have gone before who didn't know about Christ but had faith in the promises of Yahweh, okay? So four distinct people groups who the Lord pours the Spirit out on and Each one of them is showing that God's family includes any possible type of person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Your heritage, your ethnicity, your race matters not in the kingdom of God. All that matters is have we put our faith in Jesus, have we bent our knee to Jesus, okay? That is the key, and that is what the Spirit being poured out here is about. And oh, by the way, that's a pretty big deal because the Spirit's a big deal, right? I mean, He is the one who allows us to do everything. In fact, the Spirit is so important, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that it's better that He go so that the Helper may come, right? It's actually better, talk about mind-blowing statement, right? It's actually better, according to Jesus, who I've heard is a pretty reliable source, (laughs) that it would be best that we have the Spirit rather than Him. Whew. I wonder how much of us actually believe that. I mean, I know for myself, half the time I'd be like, man, I wish Jesus were right here with me. 
And then he's like, you have the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're here with me right now, right? Praise God for the helper whom he has sent. Now, what we see, verse 46, is that as the Spirit is poured out, and we see this every single time that the book of Acts says that either the Spirit is poured out or someone is filled with the Spirit, every single time one of two things happens. And it both, they both involve the proclamation, right? Either God is worshipped or the gospel is preached, and most of the time it's both together. That is the whole purpose of us walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called, we are sent, right? Like we read in Romans, we are sent to proclaim the good news, to make disciples. Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, Jesus says. And then he repeats that in Acts chapter 1, where he says, I will give you power, dunamis, the Spirit, to go preach in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? Very closely aligned statements that Jesus is directing his church. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus said, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Get what he's just saying? When you receive the Spirit, the Spirit is going to constantly, the, the verb form there and bearing witness is like, that's all he does. That is his job. He constantly is over, over, and over, and over again, bearing witness to the disciples about Jesus. Why? Why? Verse 27 of John 15, and you also will bear witness. Do we see how that works, right? The Spirit, we are, we are initially filled through the baptism of the Spirit, and then by God's grace, because He's the one who has to enable us, right? We have the desire, and we have the, the pursuit to be filled every day with the Spirit of God, who then bears witness to us about Christ. Interesting. Interesting. How much theology do you hear today from church culture that is really about you rather than about our God? Just a nice little aside there, right? We should be consumed with the person and work of our God, amen? And then what flows out of that is who we are as his adopted children, amen? Not we start with us first and maybe kind of sort of work our way back to God. But that's what the Spirit does. When we are seeking to be filled with the Spirit, He will bear witness to us about the Lord, and then we go and bear witness about Him, right? That's what Peter does, and that is what Cornelius and his family do right away. What do they say? For they were hearing them speaking in tongues, and what? Extolling God, praising God, worshiping God. That's what the Spirit does. He witnesses to us. He bears witness about Christ, and we worship our King and tell others about Him. That's how it works. Of course, it's not just for the disciples to do from John chapter 15. Praise God, we all have the Spirit, and therefore we all bear witness. Amen? So don't let the fact that Jesus said, yeah, you guys are going to bear witness. Uh-uh. We're all included in that, right? We, and that's, by the way, a privilege. Amen? Right? That's, that's a joy. That's something that is exciting, not something that we should be like, oh, I got to go. I'm, I'm like, no, no, no. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. He'll bring along the people. You just obediently listen and be like, okay, I'll go talk to him. Okay, I'll go pray for her. Oh, it's, wow, this person is really struggling right now. And you know what the antidote is? Not my earthly, worldly wisdom. It's Jesus. Amen? and wisdom from above, like James talks about, right? The Spirit does all those things through us. So that's the first baptism. But then verse 47, immediately, Peter's like, hey, who's got the water? Let's get him baptized. 
Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized. Well, that's interesting. He commanded them to be baptized. That seems a little heavy-handed, doesn't it? Like, shouldn't they have had a choice in the matter? Like, you know, they might, they might not have wanted to get baptized or you know, didn't like the water or were, like, too afraid to share their testimony or something or, you know, didn't like the fact that there were so many people around, like, hmm, hold on, I think maybe I want to, let's talk about this, we want to hold off on that one. Obviously, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek here, but I have heard all of those excuses from my brothers and sisters, and oh, by the way, I made them too. I'm not singling myself out from this. Peter commands them to be baptized. Well, geez, does he have the authority to do that? Well, who's he being like? What's the answer, Elia? Who, who is always the answer when we're talking about the Bible? You know. It's Jesus, right? It's Jesus, right? Matthew 28, we already started the passage. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's a command in the Greek. What's the next command in that text? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, we are very comfortable with the teaching part Right? We're very comfortable kind of giving instructions and saying like, hey, here's how you live for the Lord, right? And then over time, we're very good at making that a legalistic system that we have to abide by. And it's important, of course, that we are seeking to be holy as our God is holy. Amen? Like, we don't have like some golden ticket that we can just wave around and be like, I can live however I want. Woo! No, it doesn't work that way, right? We serve our king. We seek to be like Jesus as we go through this pilgrimage on this little planet which is going to be remade one day. Amen? We like to get to the teaching, but we, I think, oftentimes forget the significance of the baptism. Remember, Jesus called us to make disciples. A disciple is someone who in every way seeks to emulate their teacher. In the Jewish culture, their rabbi, right? Seeks in every way to be like that individual. Understanding scripture the way they understand scripture, right? to walk and talk and, and live as they live, to learn from them so that they can be like them. That's what Jesus told us to do. He said, go and make disciples, not of ourselves, of course, but of him, of Jesus, of our rabbi, all of our rabbi. And what did Jesus do to begin his whole ministry? He was baptized, wasn't he? We forget about that sometimes when we're thinking about our own baptism and the significance of this. We think that it's all about some spiritual exercise that we go through. And it is hugely spiritually important. But really what it is, guys, it is the very first act of acknowledging that Jesus is my rabbi. Jesus is my rabbi teacher. He is the one to whom I am submitted, and I am seeking to be like him in every way, including following him into the waters of baptism. And I love the story in Matthew chapter 3. It's in Mark and Luke as well, and kind of referenced in the gospel of John. But when Jesus is baptized in chapter 3, what happens? Immediately, what happens? Well, that's interesting, right? Do we see some patterns here, right? The Spirit of God, like a dove, descends and rests on Christ. And then, one of the few times that the voice of God can be heard audibly in all of Scripture, 
The heavens open and, and a voice from heaven says, presumably the great I am, Yahweh, he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Hmm. That's interesting that the God of the universe saw the baptism of his son with the spirit of God resting on him as a, a significant enough of a moment to audibly proclaim his pleasure in his son's humility and obedience. Even though he didn't need to be baptized, of course he was without sin, right? He was fulfilling righteousness, Jesus says. I'm, I'm fulfilling righteousness in doing this, right? And we know he is setting an example for all of us to follow him into the waters, not just because baptism is like a thing you do as a Christian, but because it is actually the first step of being an obedient disciple. And so if you are someone who wants to take discipleship seriously, which I sure hope you are, because that's really all Jesus told us to be was disciples, not just, you know, converts, not fans, not people who go to church and who like to sing the songs and read the Bible about Jesus, but people who have actually submitted him to the point that we say, you are my master, you are my king, you're in charge of me, and, and only by the power that you give me, your spirit, will I be able to actually seek to be like you, but I acknowledge that relationship, it's, it's all of you, and then my willing humility to seek you and serve you, right? And so the first step, Lord, go ahead, just, yeah, up, up, under the water, yep, let, yep, yep, right back up, right? And there's a ton of symbolism in there, which I'm not going to talk about today. We've taught on baptism before specifically. I'm really trying, I hope you see, to understand around, like, why should we be baptized? It's about discipleship. At baptism, we are given, and this is a gift, we're given this spiritual experience and communion with the Lord God, unlike any other act of obedience in our Christian walk. It's, it's a one-time deal where we get to proclaim, not just to the witnesses there, but to all of creation, who now belongs to us and who we belong to, right? Who, whose family we have been adopted into, whose identity our lives now rest. It's in Christ, right? And we are proclaiming Christ just as the Spirit leads us to do. Now, there's a ton more in there, but I don't have time. Kids, were you listening closely? I need you all to come up here now. Yep, come on up here, Asher. I need your help. Come on. That's good. All right. Now, we are going to play a game called charades. Do you guys know what that is? Okay. It's a game where you can't talk, okay, but you can, like, act out different things, okay, that I'm going to tell you. Hmm? I have theater class. You have theater class. That's excellent. So you're going you're gonna to crush this, Elia. All right, so come on over here. We're going to get on center. You guys can spread out, okay? Okay, someone over here. Yeah, yeah, come on up. Yeah, we got to get the Petruzzi girls. Get on up here. Ivory and Scarlet. Oh, tomorrow's your birth? No, wait. We just had your, we, hold on. Anyway, we're excited about birthdays. That's good. Go ahead and spread out, spread out. We're good, we're good. Yep, yep, we're good, yeah. Okay, let me move this. Yeah, we got lots of room up here. Good, all right, now. I'm going to mute my mic, and I'm going to tell you guys what you're going to act out, and then they're all going to guess, okay? Okay.
Okay, we got something. We got something. All right. All right. This is, this is, this is okay, we're going to move on to the next one. All right, next one. Okay, okay. That was supposed to be preaching. All right, okay. All right. The Lord will get a hold of you, okay, one day. What, what are they? What are they? They're birds. Yes. Yes. We got one. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Ready? Ready? Here we go. Okay. I want you guys. Go. I mean, yeah, that's, that is typically the way that one, you know, bows. But what did they all do? Yes, they all fell down. That's right, like the Spirit of God fell down like in the form of a bird. All right, we got that. Woo, okay, stand up, stand up. Okay, okay, now. I'm trying, I'm trying. Yeah, 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 they're super excited. That's right, they're rejoicing. Right, okay, all right, all right. Last one, last one. Ready? Here we go. One. Two, three. Right, remember what we were going to say? What were we going to say? The, the rule doesn't apply anymore. We can talk now. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus loves you. All right, that's right. That's right. Okay. Woo! All right, good job, kids. You can go and sit down now. Just so everyone is aware, COVID doesn't spread on the pulpit. Okay. All right, all right, that's just how that works because, you know, okay, so, that was fun, right, kids? All right, all right, you're going to remember that story forever now, right? Yeah, yeah, you better. Okay, so a couple of points of application when we take this text, we understand some of the nuances, some of the theology behind it, obviously there's a ton of depth here. But I just want to give us a couple of points of application as we close. First and foremost, number one, church, we are called every day to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is a command that Scripture gives us over and over and over again in the New Testament, right? We're called to be filled by the Spirit. We're called to walk by the Spirit. We're called to be empowered by the Spirit, right? Over and over again, Scripture tells us that our ability to do anything for the Lord only comes through the Spirit of God. Amen? Right? right? Amen. And so if we're actually going to live for our King, then the Spirit of God has to do it and has to do it in us and through us. Right? Right? And so that means that by God's grace, we humbly yet intentionally seek him and seek the Spirit's authority in our life. Because Paul tells us, Galatians chapter 5, and you guys know the passage, right, that our selfishness, our pride, our flesh is at war with the Spirit within us, right? That's what is going on. There is a battle and so church, I mean this quite literally. I'm not just saying it like, hey, we should do it a lot. Every single day, church, seek to be filled. Part of your daily communion with our king should be asking him to fill us with his spirit. 
And if you're going in to do something that you know, you have no ability to achieve success. Like, especially, I mean, that's always the case, by the way, but when it's super evident to you, pray and ask the Lord to fill you with His Spirit, that your flesh won't get in the way that the Spirit would reign in you. That is what an obedient believer does, a believer who is seeking to be a disciple and actually seeking to be a sent one, to go and do what we have been called to do. Because it is through the Spirit that we have unity. If there is a broken relationship with another believer, right, there is pride reigning somewhere in someone's heart, which the Spirit needs to eradicate. It's the Spirit of God that unites us. Why do you think the Lord used the Spirit so evocatively, so evidently with the Gentiles and the Jews? That was a moment of unification. That was a moment of bringing two groups together that did not get along. That's what the Spirit of God still does today. As we humbly seek Him, it brings power. I used the it pronoun. He is not an it. He is a he. Let me correct myself, okay? Spirit of the Lord is a he, and he brings power into our lives. He leads us into truth, right? We talked about that. He leads us to Jesus. He seals us and confirms our adoption as God's children, assuring us without doubt of our future hope with our heavenly Family forever, that's in Ephesians chapter 1 and elsewhere, right? The Spirit of God seals us. That's really what the baptism of the Spirit is, by the way. And Pastor Tim talked about that and broke that down in his past sermon. But it's, it's, what, it's what is going on when the Spirit is sealing us. That he is, he is the guarantee of our inheritance. That's what Ephesians 1 says. It does not depend on anything that we do or don't do because once we've submitted to Jesus, the Spirit is the one who is the guarantee within us, right? Again, I can't... I like talking to Holy Spirit theology. If you have questions, we'll do that offline. But it's really important that we get this. It's all the Spirit who does this in us as we go. So seek to be filled by Him every single day. Number two... If you are a follower of Jesus, get baptized. I really shouldn't have to say anything more than that, but for reasons that many folks have, they've put off their baptism or not thought it was that big of a deal. Church, I hope we see that it is a big deal. Because it it speaks to your willingness to actually be a disciple. That is what a rabbi, a rabbi would require of his disciples many different things, but what Jesus required explicitly in his command was baptism. Just as circumcision was the old covenant's sign outwardly, baptism today is the new covenant's outward sign. And guess what? It's not just relegated to men. It's all who put their faith in Christ. Amen? Now, there's no, salvif- there's no power to save. Word of the day, salvific. There we go. All right? I'm sorry. Sometimes these dumb more theology words come out. All right? There's no, there's no power to say, there's nothing salvific, there's nothing that um, relates to salvation with regard to baptism, right? What are we saved? We are saved by grace through faith. In who? Amen, alone. And that is truth. But baptism is an expectation of all disciples. And if you go through Scripture you will see, especially in the book of Acts, that that's the pattern of the church. At Pentecost, after Peter gets up and preaches, it says that 3,000 are saved, and what do they do? They got baptized that same day. 
A little later on in Acts chapter 8, we talked about the Samaritans and the Spirit, right? Well, what did the Samaritans do when they believed? They got baptized right away. And then later on in that chapter, you have Philip who goes to the Ethiopian eunuch. He shares the gospel. He explains the passage in the book of Isaiah that's talking about Messiah. And the eunuch puts his faith in Christ. Amen. And what happens? He gets baptized right away. And then Paul himself in the next chapter, knocked on his rear end, fasts for three days. The Lord sends someone to him. Paul repents, trusts in Jesus, and what does Paul do? It's just really just like a one-liner. He gets baptized. This devout Jew who has been adhering to the law his entire life has an encounter with Jesus, and he gets baptized. Which, some of you might be wondering, well, I was baptized when I was a baby. Well, we do child dedications, That's what we do here in Cornerstone, which is really about the parent dedicating that child to be baptized when they believe, right? They are dedicating that child to grow up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, right? To know who Jesus is so that when they are old enough, they may put their trust in Jesus and then be baptized, okay? So if you are here today, and you were baptized before you actually understood the gospel, I would encourage you to be baptized as a disciple of Jesus, and not just some dedication ceremony, right? Which is really what that was. From one theological perspective, I recognize that there are other theological perspectives with regard to infant baptism. We don't adhere to that here at Cornerstone. I'd be happy to talk with you about that sometime as well. The pattern of the New Testament is that when someone believes, when they, when they put their faith and trust in Jesus and they have had the gospel presented to them, they are baptized immediately. There is no delay. And so if you are someone who is a disciple of Christ and you have not been baptized, let's get that rectified. Right? Let's get that done. And we don't need to wait. We could just go down to the river and get it done. All right? Presuming that you are, in fact, a disciple of Jesus. And I don't make that presumption lightly. Right? I, I want to make sure that you're not self-deceived. We'll talk. But if you're trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, praise God, let's get you dunked, all right? In Jesus' name, and the Spirit's name, and the Father's name, because that's what Jesus had to do, right? Number three, when the gospel is preached, expect the Spirit of God to move and to show up and to do something. It might not always be a positive thing. How many of you know that? right? The preaching of the gospel is, and the the movement of the Spirit is either going to soften hearts or harden hearts. There are no other alternatives. One of two ways, sheep and goats, for me or against me, right? Scripture is very clear that there are two paths, the path of wisdom and the path of folly. That's it. And so when we go and preach, expect the Lord to show up some way, somehow, We might not even realize it. It might be going on solely in that person's heart. That's okay. The Lord knows. Our job is just to be obedient. But sometimes it shows up. The power shows up and he is present, right? The Spirit of God is there and moving and it's awesome. Praise God when we have the privilege to experience that, right? That's a great thing. But here is something I have I think, experienced and seen in more conservative church contexts, which I would generally say that we are here at Cornerstone. The Word of God talks a whole lot about humility, right? And rightly so. 
that is the quality above any other that our Father in heaven is looking for in us, right? Isaiah 66, 2 says, this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. We know that that's what our God is looking for. But what can happen is a false humility that can enter in, where we actually don't walk in the confidence and authority. I'm hearing a thing. The confidence and authority of our call and charge as disciples. Paul, when he went and preached and someone responded when the Spirit of God moved, Paul was unequivocal. He was humble, yet he was confident when he would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I think there are a lot of Christians who are afraid to make that statement. And I think that it's sin because it's false humility. It's a lack of trust in our God to actually move in us and draw us to him and have the boldness to call others to follow us because we're afraid that what? We'll let them down? Guess what? You'll let them down. You're gonna do it. We're sinful people, right? We mess up. I'm trying to get a beat, like a rhythm going. I can't find it. It's going to happen. That's okay. Our God is a God whose mercy is new every morning. Can I have an amen on that one? Amen. Right? And so we have to be really mindful that we're not falling into the trap of false humility and then not expecting the Spirit of God to move because who am I? Well, yeah, you know what? Who are you? You are nothing. But with the Spirit of God in you, you are everything. Because it's not you, it's the Spirit of God, right? That's what we need to understand. And so we go with expectation, pushing aside false humility, humbly and obediently serving our King and then expecting the Lord to show up. And when He does and people respond, we confidently say, hey, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's discipleship. That's discipleship, and that's what we're called to do as the people of God. And by God's grace, we need to keep getting better at that. We need to grow at that. Finally, well, what time is it? I'm so bad at this. I always go so long. I just want to tell you everything, right? When we are preaching and when we are baptizing, prepare for opposition. Prepare for opposition, right? Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, and immediately, who led him out into the wilderness? Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. That's important. Opposition doesn't mean that something's going wrong. It just means that it's time for us to grow and to maybe have some chinks in the armor revealed when we fall. That's okay. Praise God, he's showing us that we may respond but we will face opposition, especially if you're someone who is going to be baptized and you want to make that proclamation because, listen, in baptism, who, are, who is the chief being? I'm giving away the answer. I don't know how else to say it. Who is the chief entity that we are actually proclaiming to? Who are we proclaiming to? Yes. Really what baptism is doing, guys, is saying, hey, devil, I don't belong to you anymore. I belong to Jesus. That's really one of the significant aspects of baptism. It is a proclamation and a public witness, not just to people who are there, but actually to the principalities and powers around you declaring that you have no authority on me. In fact, by the grace of God, I have authority over you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? That's what baptism is doing, and the enemy doesn't like that. The enemy's going to test that. The enemy's going to say, oh, oh, yeah, okay. Let's see, exercise that authority, little missy. Right? I'm coming for you, Lauren. 
right? That's what happens. And it's not just in baptism. It's any time we're going to stand up and boldly proclaim the gospel, we will face opposition to see if we really believe what we believe. Whether it's an attack of doubt or whether it's some other manifestation, prepare for opposition, church. And Jesus says, when that happens, don't be alarmed. That's what is supposed to happen. Don't be alarmed. And so when you're preaching the gospel and someone shows up who looks a little off and the enemy wants to put fear in your heart, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to that, right? Opposition. The Lord will give us everything we need to work through those times, and if he shows us something that is welling up, praise God, we confess, we repent, and we return in him to worship, right? That's what we've been learning. That's that's the process. You don't need to beat yourself up. It's okay. I see it. I grow. I become more like Christ. That's what a disciple does. And of course, what both the baptism of the Spirit and the baptism of water do is they always remind us of the person and work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this is how we're going to close. You can take out your cup of for communion. Remember, church, our, the reason why we come here The reason why we come here to worship on the weekend, why we get together as a family, the primary reason why we're here is what? To worship our God. It is not here for me to get out of it what I'm going to get out of it. Please, church, let the Spirit remove that thinking from your mind. I am not a consumer of church. I am a worshiper of God Almighty. And this is why we remember together what Christ has done because if we don't keep Christ at the center of our thinking and he making the way for us to have relationship with the Father in heaven as the Spirit fills us and leads us into truth, we will make our spirituality about us. That's, we can't fall for that trap. Be mindful of that deception and that's why we do this And I'm just, I'm going to, today, I'm going to read a text from Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to encourage you to meditate upon it as it relates to the Lord's Supper, right? Remember, if you are a believer, then please, by all means, celebrate this with us. If you are not a believer, then this isn't for you. And that's okay. That's not a slap in the face. That's actually an encouragement to think about why you have not submitted to Christ. What is holding you back? Kids, let me, see your, let me see your eyes here. We do this together as a family because Jesus died for all of us. And you might be too young to really understand what's going on, and so your mommy and daddy might not let you take this yet. But that doesn't mean that you can't pray with your mommy and daddy and continue to learn and understand what Jesus has done for you. Right, Asher? Yes. Right, Corbin? Yep, you got it. Ivory Scarlet, we got it up there? Yeah? Elia, Summer, we're good? All right? I'm not going to call out the babies in the back. They don't even understand me. So we do this together as a family so that we're reminded of who our God is and what he's done. And this is what Jesus did for us. He died so that we might live. That's in a nutshell what he did. He died so that we might live. And by faith in him, trusting in him, we can have confidence in that life. Romans 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God, in Christ Jesus. Take a moment to reflect on that, to give worship and thanks to our God. Talk to your kids about the significance of what's going on. And then we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you that your body was broken for us, that you died so that we may live, and that through faith in you, we are united with that death to sin and with your resurrection to life. We celebrate that, Lord, together as we remember. Let's take and eat. Lord Jesus, we praise you that your blood was poured out, that the death you died, you died to sin, and the life that you live, you live to God, and that we can now live under your authority, the authority of life, and we do not need to fall to the power of sin in our life power of death. Lord, you have set us free from that. And we pray that we would live a life of freedom through your forgiveness, through your cleansing, through your shed blood as we have right standing with our heavenly Father and walk by the power of the Holy Spirit filled with his presence, filled to overflowing every single day. We pray this in Jesus' name as we drink together. Let's drink. As the worship team makes its way up, we are going to sing one more song. Church, I would just encourage you, as you think on this teaching today, ask the Lord to show you something that he wants you to hold on to, that he wants you to act upon, and then act upon it. Don't let it go. Amen? Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, that you are present here in our midst today as we study these two baptisms. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to draw us to you, that we would be more like you, Lord, every day, holy as you are holy, bold and confident yet humble and walking in your spirit boldly proclaiming your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.
praise you today. Lord, we lift high your name in this place, wherever we may be, even if it's at home watching this online. Lord, right now we lift our hearts, we lift our minds, we lift our hands to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we praise you, we exalt you, and we recognize that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is your name, Lord Jesus, because it was your blood that was shed. We praise you and we thank you for your humble obedience, your sacrifice on that cross because you love us and because it was the only way because no one can come to the Father except through complete and perfect righteousness. And that was you, Jesus, and is you as you remain our high priest and king forever, ruling at the right hand of our Father. And we praise you as our king, as our master. And though we are adopted into your family as brothers and sisters, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you direct all worship onto our Father, and that your Spirit witnesses to us about you, directs us to you, that we may have relationship with our Father. We thank you and we praise you. We worship you, Lord. We pray that as we go from here, that we would walk filled with the Spirit, that your Spirit would move within us, not for our glory, Lord, but for yours alone, and for the sake of, of the souls of the men and women who are dying apart from you. Lord, fill us with a boldness and a confidence, Lord, a humility to speak and to point people to you, that you might make the way open to our Father. Lord, we pray that you would pour your Spirit out on your people here, that we may be instruments in your hands, that we may see many come to faith, that they too may be baptized in the Spirit and baptized in water as your disciples, Lord obediently following you into the water, having that communion with you, pleasing you, Father God. Lord, let us go from here. In your name, in your power, for your glory. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us tonight, church. Let's go from here in the power of our God. Amen. Be blessed.